You're listening to the Brilliant Breakthroughs Podcast, episode number 27 with Maggie Magan. Hi, small business owners. Welcome to the Brilliant Breakthroughs Podcast, where we focus on creating brilliant breakthroughs for the small business owner. By the way, Brilliant Breakthroughs is also the name of the number one Amazon best-selling book for small business and entrepreneurship. The good news is you can find the book in paperback and in ebook form as well. Just so you know which one it is on Amazon, it is Brilliant Breakthroughs for the Small Business Owner, Fresh Perspectives on Profitability, People, Productivity, and Finding Peace in Your Business. Welcome everyone. My name is Susan White and I'm your podcast host. Today, we're honored to have Maggie Mongan with us. She's a number one Amazon best-selling author and anthology leader of this fine book. We're going to be talking about your business's profitability performance being supported via some unconventional wisdom sharing that delivers unconventional results. Welcome, Maggie. Thanks, Susan. This is going to be fun. It sure is. <laughs> Maggie's chapter is the first one in the book, and it's entitled Simplify Small Business Success in the 21st Century. Maggie, you covered a lot of ground in your chapter, and at the same time, you only scratched the surface on some of the challenges small business owners face when it comes to facts and myths of running a small business. What should we be focusing on to improve our business's overall performance? Oh man, there's a million things I want to share, but I, I guess we only have like 25 minutes, right? If you can, if you can take it down from a million, that would be helpful. <laughs> okay, so let's start with some good news because the next topic might not sound <laughs> so great, but the good news is that the American dream is alive and well, and that comes right out of a quote from George A. Santino, who's a retired Microsoft partner. And George was really cool when I spoke with him. His full quote is at the beginning of the introduction and then again at the beginning of the chapter that I wrote. But he was talking about how we are blessed today to be in a country where we have the opportunity to show up and create whatever we want, depending upon what our desire is. And I believe that he's correct, and that's why we have an entrepreneurial explosion and epidemic occurring this century. An epidemic? <laughs> yes, an epidemic. <laughs> oh, man. What's there... that all about? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, there is an epidemic. But let me share something with you first, which I think might start to frame uh, the conversation a little better about what's happening in the small business world with the explosion. Because there's some myths out there about what makes a successful business. And, you know, we all hear that 50% of businesses fail in the first year, right? Right. I've heard that. Yeah, it's false. The research tells us differently. And the research that I'm referring to is from the Small Business Administration. In 2016, they had a report that said a few really cool things. So um, if you have the book, you're going to already know this because it's there. But in 2013, there was 28.8 million small businesses. Isn't that phenomenal? It is. And that was five years ago. It's a huge number. It is. And out of those 28.8 million, most common are what we call micro businesses, which means there's one to nine employees within that business. Hmm. Yeah, so that's a, a little different from um, what a lot of people think. So I thought that that would be some good information to share. And then during, uh, the research comes back and says during 2004 to 2014, 78.5% of new businesses survived year one. What's the number again? 78.5. 78.5%. Is that true or not? That's the research. Wow. Yeah, so... If 78.5 are succeeding, how can 50% be failing? Right. Uh-huh. That's reassuring. It is. And it can also be a little misleading. In what way? Well, this is where the epidemic comes into play <laughs> that you want to know about. <laughs> 
that word is such a scary word, academic. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and it's funny because we're talking about an entrepreneurial explosion, which there is in this century for a lot of different reasons. And I don't think anybody can deny that. But what isn't as evident is the entrepreneurial epidemic. And I, I want to share that for a moment. It's, it's a part of why this book was created, actually a very large reason why this book was created. There are many small businesses out there that I call um, the romanticizers. They romanticize having a business, they'll take their meetings, they'll, they'll go to lunches, they'll follow up, they'll make all sorts of connections, but they won't do the true work to go ahead and build their business. That notion that it's easy to be a small business owner? Yes. Huh. That's a notion. <laughs> I think it's more than a notion. But <laughs> um, I think, Susan, I've heard you say something about who said we have to be comfortable. You know, comfortable isn't guaranteed. You say something like that often, don't That's you? That's true. That's true. We need to learn to be comfortable with discomfort. There. That's it. <laughs> And that's true with small business ownership as well. There, there are parts of running and conducting a business that call us to step outside of our comfort zone. Maybe some people don't like marketing. Maybe some people don't like networking. Others might not like bookkeeping. That's me. Or technology. That's like myself. <laughs> that's you. <laughs> right. And yet, as a small business owner, it doesn't matter what we like or what we have a propensity to naturally um, step into. But what matters is that we take care of our business and what its needs are is what matters, not what we want to do or we feel like doing on any said day. So and that's part of the epidemic? That is very much the epidemic, is there's this romantic viewpoint of what small business ought to be and it should be easy and simple and fun and lighthearted and um oh i should only work four hours a week <laughs> that sounds like a fantasy oh well <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah <laughs> and and those small business owners it's fine i call them hobbyists or entrepreneurs that's fine to be able to behave that way, but we have to understand that if that's how we behave, then we may not be getting the return or the profit um, like someone who keeps showing up and doing the hard stuff and is working at growing their business and supporting it every day. I love that term, entrepreneurial. It's <laughs> a mouthful too. It is. So is there more to this entrepreneurial epidemic? Oh yeah. <laughs> there, there is. And um, I, I go into it very well in the introduction in the first chapter of the book. So I don't want to spend too much time here. And even when I, um, at the very beginning of our podcast series, there's the first couple episodes where I'm being interviewed by Jake. And I go into this much deeper. So if somebody would like to know that, that would probably be a good place for them to start if they don't want to read the book right now. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm curious about something. You talk about four performance pillars for small business success. What are those? What, tell me a little bit about that. Okay. Um, the four performance pillars. How'd you like that dead air? <laughs> um, <laughs> the four performance pillars for small business success is something that I have developed over the last 10, 15 years of coaching small businesses. And I've, what I've come to realize is out of all the things that we do, we can go ahead and categorize them into four performance pillars, four areas where you can improve your performance. And the first one is profitability. The second one is people. The third is productivity, and the fourth is peacefulness. And as you said earlier, that's actually our subtitle, Fresh Perspectives, on all four of those. And what, what fascinates me is when small business owners are talking about how much that work that they have to do, they have these crazy long lists. And I guess now I'm going to start talking about productivity. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sounds like it. Yeah, yeah, which is absolutely fine. So we have these crazy long lists of all the things that we have to do, and they do need to be done. But there is a difference between productivity and busyness. And that's one of the things that I, I think in general, people confuse. They don't know how to differentiate between, oh, I have busy, I'm busy and I'm being productive because we have lots of stuff that we need to tend to. Technology has sped up our world so we can accomplish much more. Mm -hmm. But in one aspect, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's simplifying our lives with our schedules. Right. What I noticed too is that busyness and productivity doesn't always equal profitability. <laughs> oh, you're stealing my thunder. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. You're exactly right. And one of the things that I've come to realize is people get stuck in being addicted to busy. And it, it almost becomes a badge now. And it doesn't need to be because that badge is crushing us. In what way? Well, I cannot tell you how many small business owners that I work with that tell me they're overwhelmed. Mm. And they're like, well, I have this to do and I have, you know, the kids or the family and my business and then, you know, all of their social things. And they have this long, long litany of everything that must occur, but they're not really that that busyness is not necessarily business productivity for their business. There's that busyness you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things I help clients do is make a distinction between what is their personal and what is their business list. And then what is busyness within them and what is productivity. And productivity is the activities that move your performance needles. Tell me more. Um, here's one that is common. People say, oh, I have to go do my social media today for my business. And they go on to Facebook and they get sucked into Facebook for an extra hour. Oh, Facebook can be a huge time suck. <laughs> time suck. <laughs> yeah, it's like a vampire. Just <laughs> yeah. And then you have nothing left and you're like, oh, I'm so far behind and what do I do now? And you just got caught in busyness instead of productivity. Especially if you haven't even posted what you intended to post it, which is pretty common for folks. It can happen so easily. Right. So there's an intention that comes along with what am I doing today? What am I doing this week, this month, this year? What are my goals and how to align those actions to support you so your productivity feeds your profitability? That makes so much sense to me. And you know, even though you've been talking about productivity and profitability, it sounds like you've just gotten on the edges of the whole people piece too. <laughs> Talk a little bit more about that. Okay. Well, let me, let me say something about productivity before we go to people. Okay. Right. Because you're right. They, they, these all connect I mean, and they interact with one another very easily. The profitability side, there's something that's been happening um, for like the last 10 years that I'm noticing more and more out in the marketplace with small business owners is they're adverse to generating revenue and making a profit. Hmm. That sounds contradictory. Right. Because the IRS tells us business success by definition is creating a profitable business. And profit simply means that you have more income or revenue than you have expenses going out. Right. So it's, it's a favorable adventure. That's a successful business. Not if you feel good, not if you got a new car, not if you take off every Friday. Those are different concepts altogether. But the key is that your bottom line says you made more money than you spent. And in that regard, all businesses are the same no matter what we do. What happens is we sometimes lose track of that because we say, oh, well, I want to be more conscientious as a business owner. And conscientiousness is about doing 
things right. That's what it means. You know, are you doing the right things all the time? Sounds like working in integrity. <laughs> yes. Yes. And um, we want to do things right. When we look back 100 years ago, there were some great people that did fabulous things that launched our country's economy. Actually, you know, we can look at folks like Carnegie and what he did. And, and he was the richest man on the planet when he lived because he did business well. He was a conscientious business owner. Not only did he mass a great deal of revenue, but he was also very generous and a charitable man. And I think that's something that sometimes we forget is that our business can fuel our personal passions and help us do good out in the world. It sounds like you're touching on the peace portion of the four pillars. Oh no, wait, I wanted to stay with profitability and move to people. <laughs> See, this is how they're all connected. They definitely are. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. This is funny. Okay, back to people because people are what makes the world go round. We need money. It's not a dirty word, it's essential, and we need to embrace it as small business owners. And guess where the money comes from? Where? People. Other there you people. go. <laughs> One of the pillars. <laughs> right. And even if you say, oh, well, that's not true, Maggie. I serve other businesses or corporations. Uh, well, guess what? A person says yes to you working with them, and a person uh, goes ahead and says, yes, we will cut a check to small business owner. So it is all about people. And if you're not building your relationships, your business is not going to succeed as it could. That makes sense. Right. And, and what I want to share with everyone is the people thing can be really overwhelming, but I'm going to try to simplify it as to there's five different types of people in your business. And you need to remember that developing each one of these five roles of people in your business is essential. That's it. Just five. Do we have time to talk about that now? Very, very quickly. <laughs> okay. No, actually we have time and it's, it's simple. Um, the first one is, as a small business owner, you need to develop a team. And everybody says, well, wait a minute, you know, for the solo entrepreneurs, wait a minute, I'm just me. Well, you actually have a team. Do you, you're a solo entrepreneur being a counselor, right? Correct. But you have a team, don't you? And the first thing I think about is the person that does my billing, the person that does my printing, so on, so on, so on. That's my team. Right. And a lot of small business owners don't understand that their team can be an outsourced team. It can be their vendors. Who does their website? Um, do they have a virtual assistant? Sometimes it can be a hub that you network. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Which we'll talk about a little differently because that's its own animal. That's one of our five roles. But understanding that you have an in-house team and it's, you're always part of your in-house team. Mm -hmm. And depending upon what projects you're working on, you may have others coming in and out, or you might have everything outsourced or delegated outside of your organization. But we often combine those two depending upon what our needs are. So always be looking for good talent. Always. Always. <laughs> the second role is the customer. Oh, isn't that a novel idea, the customer? And who is your customer? D oh, different animal. We can't go there. <laughs> Don't make me go there. <laughs> but who is your customer? Your customer is the person who is actually paying for your product or services. Um, in today's world, we're starting to see a more common mm, melding of the word customer, meaning actual as well as potential customer. And that's all fine and dandy. Um, but at the end of the day, the people who pay you for what you are offering is who your customer is. That makes sense. Right. So we need to remember we have actual paying customers and we have potential customers who are prospects. And we need to show up differently for each one of those. Make sense? 
Sure does. Coolio, let's look at the third one because this is about you. You, can you believe that? It's about me personally. Well, yeah, you too, because you're a small business owner. <laughs> I am. <laughs> but it's, it's called your guidance team. And every small business owner needs a guidance team. I have a team. I make them work hard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's mentors, advisors, coaches. And again, just like what we were talking about with your team, you may have different needs at different times and you look for people to help support you so your success journey isn't as painful as you might want to make it by yourself. So having that guidance team makes a big difference. That makes sense to me. Okay, well, good. I'm loving this. Now we go back to networking. Okay, because networking, every small business owner needs to network. And I talk about networking hubs in the book a little more and I explain that. But these networking hubs are the people of influence who can connect you with the right people. Okay, so if if I want to hang out with, I don't know, whatever type of person I want to hang out with, more small business owners because they're my ideal customer, right? Well, I could go ahead and build a lot of relationships with them individually, which I have done, but I could also find people who serve them and um, network with them. Connect through the back door, so to speak. Right, right. So you start working smarter instead of harder. Well, I love doing that. <laughs> and sometimes we forget because we like being addicted to busy. Right. Uh, yeah, but I hear you. I like doing that too. And this ties very closely to the fifth role of people, which is business allies. These are the folks who can help you expand your business. Um, sometimes they're called joint ventures where you collaborate on a team or you might do some cross-pollinating with some folks as to what you have going on, but business allies are essential. And a great example for anyone who's been following this book and our podcast, our community of authors for this book are business allies to each other. Well, I can speak to that personally. <laughs> right. So um, because Susan is part of the community of authors, if somebody says to me, hey, I'm looking for a good therapist or counselor, and it happens to be in Susan's expertise, I refer Susan to them. And that has worked for me as well within our network. Sure. And, and that's business allies. It's a natural thing that we do. And we don't realize that if we're not doing it, our business will perish. It's that simple. It is really simple, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, and now I want to share the other pillar that we touched on. I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. Because it might be one of my favorites. The peace pillar. Definitely yeah. <laughs> one of my favorites. <laughs> Why is that? Because doesn't everyone want to have a sense of peace in their life? You know, I'm so glad that you said that because every time I say to somebody what the four performance pillars are, when I get to peace, they go, ah, and deep, deep sigh. Yeah, yeah, it is. What's a that about? Sigh. Well, it, it surprises me because we all strive as humans to achieve peace. And as small business owners, that takes up, you know, a work day's time or more, depending upon what, you know, needles you're trying to move. And we forget to bring peace into our business. Well, that's sort of silly. Sounds silly. <laughs> and people don't connect it. But there is a way that you can build a profitable and a peaceful business. And... Um, one of the easiest ways to do that is to be more mindful. Oh, I love mindfulness. You're talking my language now. <laughs> well, I would imagine I am since you're a counselor. Yes. <laughs> and uh, people come to you essentially for that, even though they have everything else layered on top of it, right? Right. Well, I, I really believe 
that's the reason why small business owners create their business because they have a vision of what the world can look like and it can be improved with whatever their solution is and they want to do good and that is practicing peace so ultimately when a when an individual starts their own business with these other three pillars that's the working piece and then no pun intended the peace p e a c e part is ultimately what people are looking to gain right and there are things that you can do within your business actively to be a presence of peace and we don't necessarily think of it this way because um, oftentimes people say peace oh that's a um, meditating kumbaya moment right 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 <laughs> but it's not things like self-leadership self-management that you are very different and how you bring them into your business brings you peace how you deal with customers and what your protocols are how you set your schedule a productivity tool um, brings you more peace and to me it's fascinating because I I know and I've seen this over and over again with clients that the small business that they create is a reflection of who they are and it you know how they treat their customers is a reflection of who they are as a person so your business is like a mini me a reflection of who you are right that piece of integrity again correct and if we want to look at it a little differently we could look at it as as a small business owner i'm a child I, i'm a parent and my business is a child oh i love that analogy because we take care of our children as parents don't we uh, sometimes yeah <laughs> we strive to right and there it is again about being mindful and your business is its own entity it really can't do anything without you it's just there mm -hmm. and oftentimes small business owners usually unknowingly are neglecting their baby their, their business wow when you say it that way that just gets to me <laughs> it, yeah it's pretty deep definitely yeah. we You've been very, very helpful about explaining the four performance pillars, profitability, people, productivity, and peace. Hey listeners, uh, this is how you can learn more and actually engage with number one best-selling author, Maggie Mongan. First, start by reading chapter one in the book, Brilliant Breakthroughs for the Small Business Owner. Next, boost your business's performance by going to Maggie's author page at the end of her chapter. There she offers a special invitation to simplify your small business success. Plus there's all sorts of different social media sites for you to connect with Maggie as well. And here's something that's really cool. Right now you can see everything about the book and how to get a hold of it and Maggie by going to the books app, Brilliant Biz Book. That's capital B, Brilliant, capital B, B-I-Z, capital B book, Brilliant Biz Book. When you get to Brilliant Biz Book, click on Ask an Expert and you'll see Maggie's name. Click on that and type in your question and she'll reply directly back to you. How's that for a bonus? <laughs> that's just another thing about this book that's so brilliant. Each of the other authors are also accessible in the same way. Thanks for your time and wisdom sharing today, Maggie. I really appreciated it. Well, thank you. And my final word is simplify your business as much as you can so it's effective and efficient and it supports you in your personal mission. That is inspiring, Maggie. I love that. Listeners, we appreciate you listening to the Brilliant Breakthroughs podcast where you learn about how to create more brilliant breakthroughs for your small business. Again, this has been Susan White. Shine brightly until next week's Brilliant Breakthroughs podcast.